right. All right. Um, well, okay, here's my introduction. Um, oh, did you by chance find that picture of us at the very beginning? Um, well, it's in my slide, actually, one of my slides, but not not right away. Oh, okay. But they'll see it. I'll point it out then. Is that okay? Sorry. It'll be up there later, right? It will. Uh, okay. All right. So. I know. Already. Um, <laughs> I haven't even started it's a yet. It's very bittersweet feeling to be introducing Jane Bradbury's dissertation defense. I'm happy, of course, that she's accomplished so much and is now reaching the finish line of a long process. I'm sad that I can't be there in person, and so I have to rely on this wonderful invention of Estonian geeks to be able to speak to you from Bolivia and to be able to hear Jane's talk today. I've asked Jane to show you one of the pictures that was taken back in October 2006, which I guess you'll see in a few minutes. Um, it's a before picture that we took of our lab group in our brand new lab at that time. Jane was one of the three graduate students who embarked on a journey with me then, back when none of us quite knew where we were going. <laughs> Jane is the third graduate student and second PhD student to finish in my lab, and so this represents the last stage of the breakup of the group that you'll see in the picture she'll show you later. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Major transition in my lab when last one of the initial cohort is defending her thesis. Perhaps you can understand why it feels bittersweet. Did we leave? Are you still there, or is that it? Are you taking a moment? Mm -hmm. lost one. I think we lost one. <laughs> <laughs> the time. Good timing. Oh, I know, I know. Good dramatic. It was. Oh, we're going to, if not, John and I can continue. Well, maybe I'll continue. Do you want me to Protein. try and make a separate connection? Or? Oh, yeah, we could try. Um, and I've got her thing here, too. Why don't you just go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sure yeah. on the bad end. You want to find it we, oh, we'll use that. Oh. Yeah, Don, maybe if you want to just finish talking, and I'll work on trying to get these here. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, Eve was here, and then we lost her. I can't imitate, I can't imitate her style or her diction, but to say that Jane is hardworking and an excellent student is such an understatement. As I've written innumerable times in Letters of Rec, um, Jane is not just self-motivated, she's absolutely driven. I've never known anyone with such an obsession for scheduling her time. It helps to be a mom, right? And keeping one's time managed and scheduled helps to get work done, and Jane can certainly attest to it, because Jane has had plenty to keep her time filled, as if teaching nearly every semester while studying and conducting research weren't challenging enough. Jane gave birth to a daughter halfway through her graduate studies, <clears throat> adding parenting an infant, now a toddler, into the mix. Sometimes that has meant sleepless, sleepless nights with a sick child right when she needed to be grading papers or preparing lectures, or even preparing her thesis defense. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Sunday. Teaching, Jane has taught for just about every intro of botany and biology course we offer, including 100, 130, 151, BioCore 323, 333, and intermediate courses, including algae, plant physiology, and ethnobotany. <laughs> You're qualified to be a botany professor. <coughs> she is currently oh. lecturing for the ethnobotany course while I am on sabbatical. She has served the department as a TA trainer and a writing fellow and served the college as teaching fellow. She's received several teaching awards and her professional development activities to, to learn about teaching as research earned her Delta certificate. Research, you'll shortly be hearing about her research activities. It might seem unusual for a dissertation to focus on two completely different plant taxa, but you will soon hear about the research theme that connects them. To let her get started with her presentation, I will only highlight one aspect, and that's to point out an example of her creativity in overcoming challenges. International research always encounters challenges, but international research plus pregnancy adds another dimension. When Jane found she would be unable to harvest and extract the yoka samples that had been cultivated in the common garden in Peru for her research because her baby was due at the very time when she would have had to travel, she had a creative response. She recruited one of the undergraduates who had been working in our lab, perhaps some of you know Roland Reinhardt, to travel to Peru and do the extractions of organic acids so the samples could be sent back here for her research. 
This added time to overall graduate studies, but nonetheless made it possible for her to finish the work. It's hard to imagine how the dynamics of my lab group will change after Jane moves on to other endeavors, but I know we all wish her well and all the best. Hi, Eve. Hi. Now, now I hope you will all enjoy hearing about our dissertation research, and thanks for providing such a nice written introduction. Thunderous applause. Are you good? I just will leave you here. I hear you now. I just hope it stays connected. I guess that's the only question is we won't know if you cut out. Well, hmm. well, well, oh, maybe I'll just check on you occasionally. Yeah, well, I'll check on you every once in a while. Um, well, thank you, Eve, Sorry. for that um, really wonderful introduction that you <clears throat> provided me with. So, uh, oh, I'm already a little emotional. Um, no, so I think I'm just going to go then straight into the academics involved here, <clears throat> clear out any of this, uh, a little bit of the emotion that I'm sure will come in at the end. Um, so first, I would like to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming um, to see my dissertation public <coughs> seminar here. Um, and this is a big moment for me. As, as you've mentioned, this has been a long time coming. Um, and I'm really excited to get to share with you today what I've been working on. Um, so I just wanted to start off a little bit here. Most of the people in the room are probably pretty familiar with the concept of domestication, um, but there may be some of you here that haven't thought about domestication for a little while. Um, I like to think of domestication as kind of evolution 2.0. Um, this is what really um, excites me about domestication because you get this whole interplay of multiple layers of selective forces. You get the kind of all the standard evolutionary, natural, ecosystemic selective forces, biotic and abiotic forces, but then you also have this added component of how humans are acting in this system and how we <coughs> act as a selective force, sometimes deliberately and sometimes not deliberately. Um, and, and so what we end up seeing here is that we get this human influence followed by a change in the genetics of plant populations. And this leads to a change in phenotype and ecology. Um, and this is generally thought to make plants easier to cultivate with agriculture and more edible. So there are lots of different ways that um, domestication changes wild progenitors into domesticates. Usually we see an increase in size of target organs, for example, an increase in fruit size or tuber size, seed size, infrastructure size, um, a change in phenology, <coughs> so we get uniformity in flowering and fruiting, and germination, loss of seed dissemination, and often reduced plant defenses, um, including a loss of toxic compounds. However, when I first started looking into um, domestication when I first arrived here, I discovered that there were actually a, a, a little suite of crops that are not actually edible. Um, and so I thought, wait, if domestication is supposed to make things edible, what about all these inedible crops? Um, and so this includes bitter melon, bitter almond, um, bitter <coughs> potato, which was talked about extensively um, in this book by Tim Johns, bitter maniac, which I'll talk about today, um, bitter buckwheat, which is also known as tartary buckwheat, but um, in Chinese, the Chinese common name uses the word bitter. And then I'm wondering others, and possibly, Oka, this crop that my advisor studies. Um, so I was like, hey, that'd be <coughs> convenient. Um, and also, it was a really interesting crop. So I thought, maybe could this also be an example of this? And what I was noticing about all of these crops is that they carry with them this sort of ethobotanical signature um, of a cultural pattern of crop um, detoxification that happens in food traditions. And so we see these cultural food processing techniques that generally result in a loss of the toxin and detoxifying the product. Um, and so I thought, hey, especially, um, as we'll see in a minute, sometimes Oka fits this, this signature, and so I'm wondering, okay, does it fit the rest of the pattern too, and what is this pattern? Um, so I started basically by looking in, in Maniac, and then again continuing on with Oka. So I'll tell you a little bit about, about both of those crops before I tell you about my specific research with them. So maniac um, has a lot of common names. It has a lot of common names in the sort of major world languages, and then it has also many, many other names in lots of local, smaller, um, lesser spoken languages throughout the world. Um, so in English, we call it maniac or cassava. Cassava is possibly 
better known, but um, there's a, a little <coughs> bit of a controversy over which one is the better common name. Um, the taxonomist in me sort of scoffs at common names like being better than one another, but um, people argue that cassava is derived from native words that are about the flower and refer to the cassava processed product as opposed to manioc, which is derived from native words that are of the living plant. So I will attempt to use manioc, but I will use them both. Um, and so don't get you know tripped up too badly if I start using both of these common names interchangeably. You also may know it as tapioca. Um, this is, in fact, the tapioca that's in the tapioca pudding at the grocery store. Um, so, or you use it as a thickener in pies. Um, so we are familiar with this plant, although not in its traditional context. Um, it's generally cultivated for its starchy roots, and it has a huge amount of varieties, cultivars, and land races. So huge diversity over the globe, um, and it's very important globally, especially in developing countries. It's the fourth most harvested starch crop in the world, and the second most harvested in developing countries. So a huge source of calories for um, some very poor countries, um, and therefore very important for subsistence. Okay, so it's also generally clonally cultivated. It's described as being clonally cultivated. And this is accurate in terms of what farmers plant is they plant clones and cuttings. Um, but what we'll see in a minute is that there's actually a much higher rate of incorporation of sexual offspring into the clonal stock than maybe we previously anticipated. Um, and here's, of course, what really interests me about cassava is this, this um, separation between bitter and sweet cassava. So almost all the varieties can be classified into one of two groups, where you see bitter containing more than 100 <coughs> milligrams per kilogram fresh weight of um, hydrogen cyanide. And this is sitting right at the human toxicity level. There are certainly bitter manioc at the upper end of the spectrum that produce enough cyanide to be acutely toxic to humans upon consumption of not particularly large amounts. Um, but certainly all bitter, bitter uh, manioc are in chronically in the range where they would be chronically toxic if consumed without detoxification on a regular basis. However, sweet manioc, there are, they have less than 100 milligrams per kilogram of cyanide in them, and they are not toxic. They can be eaten without detoxification. Cyanide in manioc occurs as two cyanogenic glycosides, linamarin and lodestralin, and these are both cleaved by the same enzyme, linamarase. So um, the two glycosides reside in the vacuole in the plant cells, and the enzyme resides in the cytosol, so that when it's an excellent defense against herbivory, so that when herbivory happens and the cell is crushed, the cytosol and the vacuole come in contact with one another, and the free cyanide is released, therefore hopefully poisoning the herbivore, um, and then the plant continues to live. And um, so here, this is this reaction down here. And interestingly enough, it also produces acetone, um, which I kind of wonder about if there are any effects from that. Just toxic. Um, and so, in generally, in bitter cassava, the cyanide must be removed to prevent poisoning. So this is these are some pictures courtesy of the Smithsonian Institute, the Canal Indians in Brazil, and this is the general process for detoxifying manioc. And so what you see here is first you have to peel off um, this the epidermal layer um, off of the root stock here, the two uh, the the starchy roots, and then they grate it. So this is a, the really important step where the cells are broken open, and the enzyme comes in contact, and the cyanide is released. And sometimes, in some places, they wash at this point to wash the cyanide away. Um, other times, they'll just put it straight into the traditional structure. It's called a TPT, and it's a woven structure um, where it, when you push it together, it will expand, and then if you pull on it, it will tighten, um, and the juices containing the cyanide will flow out, and you get a resulting cake of cassava pulp. Um, so, this, that sort of sets the stage for cassava. Um, so now, how does oka compare to this? So, Oxalis tuberosa is a traditional Andean tuber crop. So, um, so while well, cassava is native to um, South America and the southwestern rainforest um, uh, um, and Brazil, Oxalis tuberosa is native to the Andean highlands. We're not exactly sure where yet, but somewhere along there. Um, in Bolivia, Peru area, and um, it's cultivated importantly as part of um, the traditional 
agricultural rotation system for farmers from both Quechua speaking descent and also Aymara speaking descent. Um, and what's really, another really interesting thing about it to me is that it is an octoploid. So it's got eight copies of all of its chromosomes, which just really sounds like a lot of DNA to me. Um, so I kind of have always been interested in polyploidy because I find it to be very foreign um, in terms of what would be possible and within my own concept of biology, um, but then also because of how, what effects it has, which turns out, a little spoiler, a little tease here, um, becomes important later in my talk. So as I mentioned, um, Oka is native to this, the Indian Highlands here, and um, specifically we think more, um, it's most heavily cultivated in this area, um, but it does get cultivated even in northern Peru and um, sometimes <coughs> in Ecuador. And here we see the ranges of the two traditional um, ethnic groups that cultivate oca. And so here we see the range of the Quechua-speaking peoples from out, from um, throughout southern Peru all the way up, and then even up here in Ecuador. And um, the Quechua-speaking peoples currently are probably most well known for being in the same area and descended from probably the um, ancient Incan Empire. And they, so when you go to Cusco, this is Machu Picchu here. It's a picture I took on some of my field travels. Um, and then here are some women in Cusco who are dressed in traditional Quechua um, guard leading llamas around. And I unwittingly snapped this photo thinking, oh, authentic tourist experience. Um, and they immediately started asking me for money. So watch out. They're, they're there for pictures. And I definitely gave them money. But I was like, oh, this is not the authentic tourist experience. I thought it was. Um, but so I love including this picture in there because it has such a, I, I remember that moment so well. Like, oh, here I am, first world, moving on. <laughs> um, and so then there, Oka is also cultivated by um, Aymara speaking peoples that are primarily, um, the Aymara nation is primarily located within um, the political country of Bolivia, but then also a little bit here in southern Peru, especially around Lake Titicaca. Um, and so, what, I, what is consistent between these two cultures, in both of these cultures, oka is separated into these two use categories, where oka, some are eaten fresh after they are sweetening in the sun, um, followed by boiling or roasting, and then okas that are processed into a product called kaya before consumption. And this is kaya, and it's a very dried product. It's pretty much indefinitely storable, um, and it's a pretty intensive, lengthy processing um, process that happens. So, so at least in Quechua Ocas, they're generally soaked um, and sometimes in running water, but sometimes in still water, which would lead to a fermentation. And then after about two weeks of that, then they are taken out and they are squeezed extensively to squeeze the liquid out. And then they are left in the sun and then also out at night to gather frost to have alternate freeze and heating drying periods. And this produces this kind of fr frozen freeze dry dried product here. Um, and in, in Aymara communities, they just they generally differentiate between kaya that was soaked and kaya that was not soaked. Um, and so they will make kaya without soaking. But both of them make kaya. And in fact, what we see if we look at a little bit of folk taxonomy um, is that we see two main categories here, the use categories, because they're not processed, and because they are processed. And then within them, both Ethnic groups have their own link, um, words, taxonomy for these different um, category names. So this could be waipu or miski means sweet, waipu means boiling, keni um, means sweet. And then cultivar names below that. And then also for okas that are processed, here we just have the name kaya, <coughs> which is uniform between the two cultures. Um, and then cultivar names poshko and luki. And poshko means fermented or sour. Um, and so, this, I'm wondering, is perhaps related to the presence of organic acids in oka tubers. And so Herman and Arazo, two scientists at the International Potato Center, analyzed the, uh, the presence of six uh, um, organic acids in oka tubers. They were looking in specifically in relation to compositional changes of these tubers following uh, the exposure to sunlight that I mentioned, the sweetening process, which does result in a breakdown of organic acids. And 
in, in particular, what I started, to, I was really excited about was the presence of oxalic acid in these tubers. Um, because oxalic acid kind of fits the profile of a toxin. It's certainly anti-nutritive. Soluble oxalic acid will form crystals, and um, this, they precipitate out in the urinary tract, and this is what forms kidney stones. And then also, uh, it can cause nutrient deficiencies, um, if basically because it will absorb the calcium from you in order to form the, calci the calcium oxalate crystals. And also, it has the potential for acute toxicity, which is reported in doses between 2 grams and 30 grams. Um, but these are, this was old data. This is from like the turn of the 1900s. And they didn't have, it's not per unit of weight. So all of these doses, these are just obs observations by physicians of people dying from these various doses. So it's hard to know <coughs> what it is per weight. Like, hey, was this 2 grams a little kid? I don't know. Um, and oxalic acid is found in OCA in with very, uh, kind of a wide range of reported values in the literature. Um, and, and in particular, people were really skeptical of these values because they were abnormally high. Um, and it was hard to find a consistent picture. But with these values being considered to be the most reliable because they use the most modern techniques. Um, so I had some kind of really big questions, right? So I really wanted to know, like, what do people want from their food and how do they get it? What can we learn about the interplay of anthropogenic and ecosystemic selective forces in domestication from studying toxic domesticates and their associated cultural traditions? And why do these toxic domesticates even exist in the first place? Um, these are not the kinds of questions that I can address in a single dissertation. However, um, we all have to take baby steps towards our goals. So here's the picture. Here we are, um, 2006, yep, fall of 2006 embarking upon a journey, right, where we had no idea where we were going. I still don't. Um, but we're just hurtling forward. And um, so here I am at the beginning of this long journey, and I'm working closely also with the International Potato Center, and then with Dr. Doyle McKee at the Center for, the, uh, for Functional and Evolutionary Ecology in um, Montpellier, France. And I'm looking, I want to look at two crops, Maniac, and I want to start with Maniac because it's decently well known. It's well studied. There's been a lot of background research on it. We know what the toxin is. We know the pattern. Um, as whereas with Oka, this is unknown, but maybe it's the acid, and that's what I wanted to find out. So I was going to start with some genetic analyses of Maniac, and then move on to investigate whether or not Oka fits into the same category of domesticates. So. What was interesting to me about manioc is that there is an unknown evolutionary history regarding the origin of the, of the two types of bitter and sweet. And it's generally assumed that, it's generally believed, there's no evidence to suggest that there are multiple um, origins necessarily, but we don't know if bitter was the first form of the domesticate and then there was directional selection that continued on towards the sweet or was it an intermediate and then there was divergent selection. Um, disruptive selection that led to the two extremes, or is there something else going on? Um, and so I wanted to know, just to start off with, are these two types genetically differentiated on a population level? So um, with the un with kind of testing the underlying assumption that if they are genetically differentiated, especially across um, areas of introduction versus native range, um, it, on a very large geographical scale, if we see cassava um, separating together, then that would suggest to me that perhaps that this differentiation is, is stronger and older than if we were to see differing patterns, um, heterogeneous patterns across the planet, um, which would suggest to me that differentiation um, between bitter and sweet cassava does not have a neutral um, signal that accompanies it. And so three studies on the local scale imply, yes, that they are, um, but what we don't know is what was happening at the global scale. So I asked two primary questions. Are maniac collections genetically structured by use category, geography, or neither? And are there consistent patterns in genetic differentiation among bitter and sweet maniac across multiple geographically distant collections? So um, thanks in all entirely to my wonderful collaborators on this project. We were able to amass a sample set that would allow me to somewhat address these questions. Um, and 
So I was able to travel to France to work with Doyle McKee, and everybody else sent samples to me, and I extracted the DNA and genotyped them there in his lab. And then um, what I also wanted to point out on the sample table is that what you might notice here is that at the end, the number of genotypes of bitter is 70, and the number of genotypes of sweet is 125. And together, they should add up to 195. But it doesn't. Because what we discovered after we did the genotyping was that there were seven clones that some farmers classified as sweet and other farmers classified as bitter. This was very, in a way, concerning to us because it's very important for farmers to be able to accurately classify their cassava or else they run the risk of being exposed to cyanide. Um, and so, especially in Africa where a lot of the protein does not contain a lot of the sulfur containing amino acids which are necessary for cyanide detoxification in the body, cyanide, the potential for cyanide based diseases is really strong. Um, and so when we started seeing the evidence that farmers were inconsistently classifying their clones, this was immediately a red flag for us. And in fact, what do we see when I look at genetic differentiation? So this is um, a double principal coordinate analysis and basically, this is a way to look, to visualize a distance matrix that's con constructed between genotypes. So um, the farther apart points are on this graph, the higher their dissimilarity is, the less similar they are, the more different they are from one another, and the closer together they are, the more similar they are genetically. Um, and so what we immediately noticed was that, and in fact it turns out to be a significant differentiation, this group of the bitter from South America um, we're significantly differentiating from everything else, and no, there was no other significant differentiation throughout the group. And this was really kind of interesting to us, because we were like, hey, how come these South America bitter and these Africa bitter are giving us a different signal? And when we look in South America, just at South America, what we do see is a significant differentiation between bitter and sweet. Um, and we also see geographic structuring which this p-value is for bitter and sweet. Um, and yet when we look in Africa, we do not at all see the same pattern. And in, in some ways, it's always nice presenting these two figures side by side because they're so obviously different. Um, I sometimes laugh when I have to say, look, it's different. But so what was really, and, and then you see here that there's no evidence, statistical evidence for differentiation. And what we started really wondering here, um, well first, what was important is that this pattern here is, was supported by similar results from Brazilian land races. So I forgot to mention my sampling table. Um, you also might be, maybe notice that I don't have any samples from Brazil, which would be pretty important if I'm gonna be evaluating the native range of manioc. Um, but however, there's another graduate student, another PhD student, um, Gilles de Mullen, who is working with Charles Clement, um, and she is doing this exact project, but for Brazil. So I didn't, you know, we didn't want to take over anything there. Um, and generally, now we're kind of cooperating so that hopefully someday I, I kind of dream of combining our data sets when everything, everybody is published um, and finished. But um, right now, it is nice to know at least that in her results, she sees the same pattern of the differentiation of bitter and sweet um, maniac in Brazil. Um, additionally, other studies have previously shown that maniac from French Guiana and maniac from bitter maniac from French Guiana and bitter maniac from Brazil are genetically very similar to one another. So originally, initially I just said, okay, this is not evidence to me for any kind of like carried over ancestral division between types except then things get a little tricky because when I started, when I put things through structure to get a quantitative picture, I saw this exact same pattern where the French Guiana bitter were very different, but now I could see very clearly that it wasn't so much that they were different, so dramatically different from everything else, um, but that the Africa bitter were genetically speaking, structurally almost exactly the same as the Africa sweet. And so now I'm thinking, wait, what happened in Africa? Um, and we had several possible hypotheses. Could there have been a second derivation of bitter from sweet? Um, so that maybe that the bitter population that we sampled in Africa was actually derived from the sweet population? 
This is unlikely due basically to the history of the introduction of bitter cassava. Um, so in Africa, manioc was introduced primarily to provision returning slave ships, and it was introduced as a, in order to make the flour, in order to make the processed food product. So it was definitely not the sweet cassava that was being introduced. It was the bitter cassava that was primarily introduced to the country. So this made the, the ancestral state of maniac in Africa is bitter. So this made this first hypothesis really unlikely. Um, could this just be the remnants of a founder effect or some bottlenecking that happened? Um, and so I used rarefied allelic richness as my primary measure to address this. And in sweet maniac, I did find some evidence um, for bottlenecking here, but then I did not find evidence for a founder effect or bottleneck in bitter maniac. Um, and, and this could be accounted for it's just simply by the fact that bitter maniac has been being introduced to, <coughs> to Africa many times <coughs> and for much longer than sweet maniac has been being introduced to Africa. Um, and so founder effect was unlikely due to this highly like richness. And I thought, but wait, what about sexual reproduction? Is this possible in a fully propagated crop? And lo, it turns out some very interesting um, results here. So I. I went to the alleles that were involved here and I tried to figure out what is it, which alleles are responsible for differentiating among my, my samples in my data set here. And what I noticed was that there were a set of alleles, I call them sweet type alleles, that were present in every single one of the sweet groups, but were not present in the bitter, the French Guiana bitter group, but then were present in this West African bitter group. And it was really these alleles that were driving a lot of this pattern of pulling the West African bitter to be more closely related to um, the sweet overall, the global sweet picture, than the other bitter. And additionally, this is when we started to remember the importance of these double classified clones. And we hypothesized that these double classified clones are actually intermediate toxicity levels. Um, so cyanogenesis in cassava also exhibits a fair degree of environmental pl um, plasticity, a phenotypic plasticity. And so basically, if there were to be hybrids between bitter and sweet offspring, then these, these offspring could easily, in some environments, be bitter and in some environments be sweet. Um, and so we're starting to realize that in Africa, some, somehow the sexual barriers between bitter and sweet cassava have broken down. And what we realized was that this was, um, so not only was sexual reproduction supported by the apparent admixture of sweet and bitter alleles in Africa, but it was also supported by observed differences in cultivation practices between South America and Africa. Um, in South America, bitter and sweet manioc are separated in the fields. Um, this is also serves an additional use for the people because what they do is they put the sweet manioc by their home so they, they cite the reason for this is a difference in predation. Um, and so sweet manioc are prone to predation. And um, so what they do is they put it by their house and they can guard it and keep the predators away more easily. And then also when the, the herbivores come to eat the sweet manioc, then they, they will shoot the herbivores and hunt them. So it's like this extra layer there. And then they put the bitter manioc in the forest because it can survive in the forest and doesn't need the attention. However, in Africa, they are not separated. And so um, what we started to realize is that this loss of the traditional knowledge surrounding how to grow and process this crop was going, it was, and in the end, had, is having some pretty significant um, impacts on the public health in the countries that are in this, in cassava growing regions. Um, and so we're wondering if, if this is actually to help ex can help explain a sudden rise in, in cyanide-related chronic illnesses that particularly um, Mozambique and other countries in West Africa have seen rise since the 1980s. Um, and so in conclusion for the cassava portion, what we see is there is a genetic differentiation in South America. There's no differentiation in Africa. And we don't think this differentiation is hugely historic because we believe that it's being maintained via agricultural separation in South America. Could this be disruptive selection, directional selection with pauses? We're still not sure. Um, Gilda is hoping to now include some wild stuff with her, with her Brazilian analyses so that maybe she can help answer some of these questions. Um, and then since being introduced to Africa, 
we see a mixing of alleles and use categories, which is resulting in illness. And um, strong evidence for sexual reproduction in the crop. So how does this really kind of back those big questions? So what do people want from their food and how do they get it? So with manioc, what I learned from all my studies on manioc is that food storage obviously is really, really important for subsistence um, societies. And culinary value, so often people describe bitter manioc as tasting better, they love the flour that it makes, they love the bread that comes from the well, the flatbread that comes from the flour. Um, pest resistance, so cited, um, and some evidence scientifically to suggest that manioc, particularly to herbivores, um, has a higher, bitter manioc has much higher pest resistance. And then, um, but then there's this labor cost, so we have the sweet manioc, right, to then kind of balance out some of the labor. And I, we still aren't sure about the evolutionary history that resulted in this, um, but we're certain that it's just at least one progenitor. We're, there's still no evidence for multiple progenitors. Um, and so, however, now what about Oka? So we get food storage. Is pest resistance an issue? What's the history that's going on here? And what can we learn about the interplay of these selective forces? Um, so with manioc, maybe this conflict is circumvented with processing and agricultural techniques. But when there's inadequate transfer of this traditional knowledge, we get disease. And then in Oka, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Ten seconds. Um, so is there a biochemical difference underlying Oka's use categories? Does Oka fit into this pattern? And is Oka biochemistry consistent across ethnic groups? Do Oka use categories differentiate from one another based on any of these variables? Ethnicity use category, neither. Um, what can we learn regarding Oka's evolution and basis for Oka's use categories? So these are the questions that I set out to answer. I started by going through and um, taking some pH measurements of all of the Oka to, uh, Okas that are grown in seep germplasm collection. So here basically is this data. So um, this data does suggest, <coughs> that at least in the Quechua Okas that are in seep germplasm, um, that acids do seem to be a difference between the use categories. So here's the distribution of these. And you can see, first off, that the collection is vastly skewed towards these, um, these low acid varieties. And then there are a few down here that did have significantly lower pH. And um, here is the box plot just kind of representing the same data. And this does come out to be significant, although I my <coughs> Sorry. But the real question comes now, which oka or which acid is, is going to be responsible for this pattern? And so also, what about these Aymara okas? And what variables are affecting oka population structuring? Acid content, oak taxonomy, farmer ethnicity. So starting out to investigate organic acids in oka, I sampled from the seep and the anio germplasm. I used pH variation as a method to choose my varieties. So I really wanted to maximize variation in pH. And then within that, also representing these five groups in this folk <coughs> taxonomy scheme. So unprocessed from both Quechua and Aymara, specific cultivar processed from both Quechua and Aymara, and then this also just some random ocas that were just called Kaya, um, but that were from Quechua localities. And I grew them in a common garden six times in a randomized block design. And then I harvested the ocas. Well, I did not, as Eve mentioned. Um, raw and harvested, we planted raw and harvested, and then I received these acid extractions here, and I quantified them because I wanted to make sure that they were all in the same quantity of, of, of hydrochloric acid, purified them down, and put them into an HPLC. Unfortunately, uh, there are always problems with PhD. And at least my samples did not incubate at ambient temperature. Uh, mine were held at 4 degrees C, but they were held for 10 months because there were some problems. Um, at least they didn't get to customs. Whew. Uh, but yeah, so I was also, it was also necessary that I do a degradation experiment. And luckily, I actually found um, Oka being sold in a grocery store in Austin, Texas when I was visiting my parents, and I was like, oh my god, it is, it's there. It was one of those moments you know, where you think, there's so many times you're like, oh, this is never going to happen. I'm never going to finish this. And then you're like, oh, I can't do this degradation experiment. That's going to be the end of me. And you walk down the grocery store aisle of a Christmas break, and it's just sitting right there. And you're like, wait, 
how does this happen? <laughs> um, and so I brought those ochas back with me across no international borders, um, in spite of Texas's best efforts, and um, brought them here. And I extracted them and quantified their organic acids on the very first day of the day that I extracted them, and then again a week later, and then again for six more weeks. And then I waited, and it's funny because I stopped because I thought I was going to graduate. Oh, here, and maybe like here, and maybe here. And then I got here, and I was like, hell, it's been a year. I might as well do another measurement and see what's going on. Um, and so what was really remarkable to me, well, first, what was I was at least very relieved about was that oxalic acid remained very stable. And that was not such a surprise to me because this extraction protocol was designed for oxalic acid. Um, it was not designed for these other organic acids, but I thought that it would do well enough. Um, and it perhaps would have done well enough um, if I could have ex ex analyzed them on day zero, but even the amount of time it would have just taken them to ship me had they, had they shipped them to me right away would have caused a significant depletion in these other organic acids. And what's also interesting about this degradation pattern is that it is the same pattern that happens that Herman and Arazo reported in the ochas when they are sunned um, and the tubers and when they are put in the sun and the organic acids degrade. I think that it relates to the inherent properties of the acids, specifically size and branching um, number. And oxalic acid is really small. It's the smallest of these organic acids um, and just doesn't have as much to lose. OK, so now that I was confident in my data, I had to let go of the other organic acids and just work with oxalic acid. Um, and here we see this distribution of oxalic acid and oga tumors. So we see it's basically matching the pH distribution. We do see it's completely bimodal. These groups do significantly separate from one another. Um, and then what was also interesting to me is, as kind of a little side project, while my undergraduate was harvesting the tubers, I had him score the tubers for weevil damage. Because I wanted to kind of find out, are these, if there are high acid ochas, are they more resistant to the oca weevil or not? So is, could this be related to pest resistance? <clears throat> and actually what I found out is that they are not significantly more resistant to the oca weevil. Um, and, and so I'm not saying that this should be taken as some like sort of definitive, oh, there's oca is not, sour oca is not more pest resistant. Um, there are plenty of other pests to look at, particularly water molds, um, are a big problem, but it did not immediately play into this concept that, like, well, it left me still wondering why are they growing these ochas, especially when what I then learned, when I related these acid values to these use categories, um, what we saw was that, yeah, here were the ones that were really high acid, producing at times between 400 and 600 milligrams per uh, 100 grams here, and at times, I mean, especially if we're down here with the really sweet ones, easily 60 times the quantities of oxalic acid in the tubers, usually even on average four to five times the quantities of oxalic acid in the tubers. And these super sour ones, they're present only in the Pochco group. So none of the other processed ochas came out to be producing significantly qu greater quantities of oxalic acid. Maybe they produce significantly greater quantities of a different organic acid. Um, I don't know because I couldn't get that data. But this was then additionally confusing to me because it's like, okay, wait. So if they are obviously processing low acid ochas into kaya and they don't need high acid ochas to make kaya, and the high acid ochas aren't better against at least the weevil, why? And I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, I hope someday I will. But we'll see here in a minute that these high acid ochas get even more mysterious. Um, so in the meantime, we've got an incomplete correlation of folk taxonomy and tuber oxalic acid content. We have some of the four genotypes, or four genotypes, some of the Pochka ochas accumulate significantly higher quantities of acid in tubers. And now I'm asking what sort of patterns of neutral genetic differentiation do we observe? Farm ethnicity, folk taxonomy, acid content now, these are the three variables I'm really concerned with. I'm going to jump straight to the most complex figure. Um, here it is, all the variables stacked on in one. And um, it's a little confusing, so I'll kind of walk through it. But what's really important here is these are the high acid pochcos, and they very significantly differentiate from all of these other groups. I tested this differentiation using a permutation test, 
um, which is a little bit different from the Amoeba that I used in the cassava stuff, but the underlying visualization is the same. And um, there is also some differentiation, particularly in the extremes, like this region versus this region, um, uh, between these sweet ochas. So uh, I feel confident being able to call them sweet, I guess now. They're at least low oxalic acid ochas. Um, and so we don't, we do see some other sub-differentiation here that goes on structuring, but this is certainly the driving variable in the pattern. And um, so again, I wanted to look to see, okay, when I look at my alleles, where are they falling? What alleles are driving this pattern that I'm seeing? And so what was really interesting to me is that there was this large number of alleles. I mean, almost a third of the alleles that were in all of the other OCA groups except the high acid poshkos. Um, and then there were other alleles that were present in all of them. And then just a smattering of alleles that were private <coughs> to one group or one way of analyzing the data. And then some that were having heterogeneous patterns that just didn't really seem to have any pattern to them. Um, and But this was really to me very clearly what was driving the pattern that we were observing in the differentiation. And additionally, what I noticed is that all of the low acid ochas have two or more loci with greater than five alleles, whereas all of the high acid ochas have all loci with four alleles or fewer. And when you're dealing with an octoploid, you would expect to find some areas of the genome with heterozygosity that would present five to eight alleles. Um, so to find across eight loci, such low heterozygosity that you don't even get greater than five alleles was interesting to me. Um, and I thought could also account for this pattern that we observed. Additionally, there is evidence for low poiety in OCA. And um, this is Kelly Vivanco, which I forgot her little title. Um, and Kelly and I have worked together at SEEP a couple times, and now we are collaborating on a publication that includes this flow cytometry data um, where she identified seven Poshko accessions that have one half of the DNA content of oct octoploid ochas. And in her accessions that she found this with, this included two of my high acid ochas. Um, and so what I realized is that now we have evidence that two of these high acid ochas are touch strong evidence that two of these high acid ochas have half the quantity of DNA are probably tetraploids. Um, and then other evidence that the other two of these high acid ochas fit the same genetic pattern um, on a genotypic level. So I really wanted to confirm the existence of these low ploidy ochas. So I went back to Peru. Um, and here I have to thank Lauren Mosco. She'll be thanked again too. Um, but she, th these are her ochas that she did in her field collection. It was just fortuitous that I just happened to stay long enough to be able to collaborate with her. It's been a, a, such a wonderful collaboration. Um, so it was great that I was able to go and harvest leaf tissue um, that was mutually beneficial to both of us. And um, I, I targeted 76 of her collections to use for flow cytometry analysis to quantify their nuclear DNA content. I gathered, all the opus I gathered belonged to the Quechua processed use category um, because I wanted to know if, if I had evidence from my previous genetic data that there, some of them were octoploid anyway, and some of them would also possibly be tetraploid, targeting the poshkos for the possibility of tetraploids. Um, and I, I need to be careful calling them tetraploids because we haven't confirmed this with root squashes yet. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what I found when I did flow cytometry is that there is a bimodal distribution um, of samples that are that have the same quantity of DNA in them as known octoploid OCA standard samples, and then a whole set, 19 samples, that had half the amount of DNA. And we are using this to infer ploidy. Um, however, it's important that we know that there are multiple mechanisms for, by which a cell could have half the quantity, the nucleus could have half the quantity of DNA. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be chromosome copy number, but the likeliest scenario is that these are tetraploid and these are octoploid. And I'm working with some of my collaborators in Peru right now to hopefully get some root squashes so that we can look at um, the karyotypes and confirm that they are actually low copy numbers 
um, true tetraploids. Um, but so this was really exciting to me, and I'm continuing work with these 19 samples, thanks to Elizabeth Kavekis, who is also going to be mentioned in a minute, but who happens to be here, um, who is working on genotyping um, these samples for me, and hopefully we will be able to see a similar pattern um, with the tetraploids differentiating. And I'm hoping that when I get the genotypes of these tetraploids, the two that I have acid data for but don't have full cytometry data for, that those genotypes will be there and I'll find the clones and then it would all be together. We'll see. Um, so when we kind of pull it all together and look at these two crops together, what do we see? So we see similar cultural patterns but with very different evolutionary histories. So the presence of two different poities in Oka um, really confirms for sure that there are separate origins for this crop, but it also raises questions in terms of what did, are these, is the tetrapoid and the octopoid, did they come from completely separate origins, independent events, or is there a stepwise domestication process that's going on with multiple hybridizations? So there are a lot of interesting evolutionary questions that are raised by the confirmation of the existence of inconsistent poidy and oka. Um, and this is very, very different from any of the evolutionary um, history of cassava that we know of. And so this also, I think, really highlights the importance of ethnobotany in a lot of these, in a lot of these studies. Because without looking at food processing traditions, language, um, cultural perceptions of these plants, and cultural inconsistencies in treatment of these plants, I would not have been able to understand the data that I was seeing, um, nor ask the questions that I asked. And in the future, what I'm really hoping um, to do is confirming this 4X versus 8X in Oka um, and the correlation with oxalic acid production. Um, this is really in interesting to me because it represents a really possibly amazing study system to look at how ploidy and polyploidy events then affect phenotype because we could possibly have this direct relationship between a polyploidy event and um, an increase in oxalic acid production or decrease in oxalic acid production in, in the tubers. Um, and then also, so what's really even perhaps like probably to a lot of other people more interesting about these four exocas is the implications that it has for crop diversity and the conservation of crop genetic type diversity. Um, because these low ploidy ocas are so far, we've only found them in one river valley in the Cusco department of Peru, a very geographically isolated area. If this is the only place they are, they're certainly very prone to dying out. This would be an extreme situation um, in terms of conservation of these varieties, but also um, we, right now, my sampling does not include Bolivian samples, and so we really need to start working with the Bolivians too. I, I hope that my work can encourage um, the international teams in Peru and Bolivia to work together with Oka um, and look to see if there are high acid or low floaty Ocas in Bolivia. And so when I come back to these big questions, I see, I, I see that Oka does fit into this scheme, um, which is really exciting to me. Oka certainly fits in here in some respects to the scheme. Um, but what's interesting is that its value seems primarily in food storage, um, which could carry some significant cultural um, information in terms of how uh, at risk people are for food loss and crop loss. Um, and, and then there's also these, this question of multiple origins. And when we look back here at this, what can we learn? Um, what's still unresolved for me with Oka is why are they growing the sour Oka? And, and I think that this question can really be addressed by looking to see how, if we can confirm how wide the range, distribution range of the sour Oka is, of tetrapoid Oka is, um, and should be addressed also ethnographically um, with some interviews and asking local farmers, why do you grow this if you can process the other stuff? Um, there are some other possibilities with oxalic acid, um, maybe playing a role with calcium metabolism. Um, that would be something I would love to look at, but it's certainly um, a big question. Oh my goodness, and with that, oh, there's so many people to thank. This work would not have been possible without so, 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 so many people, um, directly and indirectly. Um, I can't even, I'll start at the beginning. So first off, obviously my advisory committee, 
for answering so many questions and being so patient with me. Um, and then also, oh, already. Oh, that's just my advisory committee. I don't even like you guys. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, okay, so obviously the botany department. Um, also, oh, Cecile, she's not here because I'm sure she's teaching, but she was a wonderful statistics professor um, and also read so much, so many annotated statistical notes in French for my French collaborators for me um, and was just so helpful with so many of my questions. Um, and then the wonderful women in the graphics lab for helping me. I am woefully inept at Photoshop and they have made my pictures so beautiful and, and really put a great face on them for publication. And the amazing office staff in the department, um, they cannot be thanked enough. They have saved me so, so many times um, and they've just always been willing to help and they've always been a big cheerleader for me. Um, so we should all really appreciate the staff that we have. Tons of people at the International Potato Center. Um, David Tai, Carlos Rizzo, Seth Dehan have all served as the leader for the Crop Genetic Resources Conservation Division. Um, and so I have worked with each of them closely. Um, Dr. Gabriela Burgos, let me use her lab. Senior Francisco Vivanco um, it works at the field station in Huancayo and coordinated all of my planting and harvesting and was a wonderful mentor and guide to me and also took really good care of Rollin when I sent him there. Kelly Vivanco, my collaborator. Tom Carivio for guarding my ocas um, and helping me, I mean, for planting them, really. Um, although, Sam did a lot of the planting, too. And tons of people also for my research team in France. Professor Dwayne Lecky, um, Laura Benoit, who teaches me how to use Gene Mapper, Marie Pierre Dubois, who teaches me how to use the lab. Um, Caroline Pouillet for just always being there with me and tolerating the my sometimes terrible French mistakes that I didn't know I was making. Um, and then for Tweek Sakira and the entire team there for um, letting me, or for doing the genotyping for me, and uh, in terms of using their ABI sequencer. And then Professor Jean-Claude de Bien, who helped oversee the exchange. Many undergraduates, I should have put their pictures up, but I don't have all their pictures, and I'm sorry I ran out of time. Rollin uh, for going to Peru, and I'm so glad that that opportunity helped him get the experience that got him into graduate school where he is now. Um, and Allie for, um, and Jesse both for helping me do the DNA extractions for the, um, my common garden samples. Peter for his work with flow cytometry and Elizabeth um, for her continued work with genotyping. You have all made such huge contributions to this work um, and many of them will be on publications with me. Funding, I always paid some money sometimes to do this. And um, in particular, the Graduate Women in Science funded me twice, with once with a travel award and then with a large grant fellowship, um, which really made possible the second two chapters of my dissertation and paid for about half of the third chapter, too. So, uh, Also, the Body Department, Davis Research Grant, yay, twice, thanks, guys. Um, Judy Croxdale Award for Women in Science, Biology Travel Grant from um, LNS, T. Grenade from Lassus, and then also the um, Face Exchange brought me to France. Oh, the family and friends slide. Couldn't have made it through. Oh, I'm a <laughs> this guy, right here. And it's my sister-in-law's birthday. Yay! Happy birthday, Sarah! Whew, you gotta give me an anchor on this slide. My mother-in-law came and watched Elle for two of my field trips to Peru. Wouldn't have been able to go without her. Wouldn't have been able to make it with a lot of her encouragement. Um, my parents, my whole family, my parents and my mom for just um, always teaching me to keep going and be determined. I trust that by the end of today I will be the third Dr. Bradbury right behind her uh, and my grandfather. And uh, Andy and I, we came here together and um, this is a big day for me to, to see. I wish he were here. I'm glad I got to see him. Um, I know, I'm okay, I'm good. <laughs> you, you, I need to thank you, both of you. Um, my wonderful daughter, there she is. 
Um, she is always so much happiness in my life, and even on the worst days, I can come home, and she's so happy to see me, and it makes me feel like a completely different person. I totally could not have made it through this without her. Oh, and Sam. This Thanksgiving, it will be eight years since Sam decided to move across the country to be with me here. Um, and I know that I never, it, did, it took me maybe three weeks here for me to realize I couldn't do it without him. And I called him and I said, I need you. Um, and he has been to France with me. He's been to Peru with me. Um, he has done late nights. And he has always been here. He prepared most of his food for you. Um, so, enough. I can't, I just can't say it. I really could not have made this through without you. So, on that note, mm -hmm. I would like to invite you all to ask some questions. I think I can answer them. Yeah, Ken. Can I ask you a question about the, um, bittersweet manioc, the one in Africa that yeah. are neither bitter nor sweet. Right. I was a little confused by that. So the sampling, were you saying that that, that clone, which you could recognize for some feature, some farmers called it sweet and other farmers called it bitter? So when I, we did the genotyping and we would get our genotypes, then we would find that the same genotype, independent samples, we, we duplicated genotypes a lot in our sampling. Mm -hmm. And that the same genotype would be found, some farmers when we collected it said, oh, this is a bitter. And then the same genotype other farmers had reported it being sweet. I see. So you, based on the genotype that you did in the lab and then went back to the people. Well, we went back to was... the original field notes. Oh, OK. Because when they were collected. Was that grown in the same environment? No, definitely not. So it could be environmentally induced? Mm -hmm. um, which normally. The environmental variation in cassava cyanogenesis is not great enough to account for kind of the gulf between the bitter and the sweet. Um, but if there were situations where they were sexually mixing, that would absolutely be possible. What kind of differences were in the environment? Um, well, so the variables that are impactful for cyanogenesis, nitrogen availability is really important. Um, so increased nitrogen availability increases cyanide content significantly. Um, and then also water limitation. So if there were drought, that will increase cyanide content. Those seem to be the two biggest variables that affect cyanide content in cassava. But you're just speculating on these hybrid um, clones, right? You don't actually have well, evidence we would not, that under different environmental conditions. No, right. We wouldn't cyanide production. Right. We don't have. We so we did not get any cyanide data for the plants we collected. We just had classification data by the farmer. Could that help explain the incredible range that the published literature shows from 20 milligrams all the way to 500? That's oxalic acid. Or, oh, I like it. It's great. Okay. Never mind. So, <laughs> do I'm they, glad I do that. Do they also process the, the manioc the same way in Africa? Um, they don't use the TPT. Well, and most people don't use TPTs anymore either. I mean, there are a lot of varieties, but it's all variations on the same theme of smashing leaching, drying. What, what, how did you genotype these? I wasn't actually quite oh, sure I what the data. Oh, I used the SSR loci. Oh. Yeah. And we picked, so I, I picked from um, loci that were, my collaborators had also used, and that their data had shown, had showed the highest amount of variability among their clones to sort of maximize the variability that was at each locus. And then a couple that had low variability to sort of anchor it together. I have other questions. Oh, well, keep on going. <laughs> keep here. It's so interesting. It's very interesting. Can I have your sound? But then you got quiet. Oh. Well, yes. So you have your sampling, you know, has a lot of African and then Polynesian, well, Oceanic islands, which you know, may have been French colonized or yeah. dispersed or whatever. But but your sampling in South America seems pretty low, given that yeah. Maniac is such a dominant no, crop in Central and. I mean, I didn't want to take her stuff either. The Brazilian one. Yeah. Yeah. But but. It's her, you can't do that. But what about 
other places? Yeah, well, we could, if I had been able to do field work, then, and that's my hope, is to then in the future be able to return to these questions. Um, but we were sort of, the nature of the study was that we were just basically asking for leak tissue and to see who would give it to us, and they would not hmm. for that reason. Took what you could get. Yeah. <laughs> It was definitely very opportunistic. Um. I have an odd oh, yeah. question. Um, on, this is just based off of your second slide. When you had the non-edible mm -hmm. um, domesticates up there, you put bitter melon up there, mm -hmm. which um, to my understanding, well, I've, I've eaten bitter melon before. Mm -hmm. I've never prepared it before, but mm -hmm. to my understanding, people use it as a tea, and I was just wondering why it was classified as a non-edible. Um, because it also, it's something that you could not eat, like, like other sweet melons, like cucumbers, mm -hmm. like you could not slice it and eat it raw. Okay, okay. There, there are specific process, not, it's not, it's not as elaborate processing, there are specific preparation mm -hmm. techniques that are necessary to make it. Okay. And, and I don't know if it's really toxic or not, um, but certainly not taste, it's very unpalatable. Okay, sure. Uh, without that. Mm -hmm. So would you include olives in that category? Um, so, well, I guess olives don't have the other kind, right? Um, they all need oh, so to be also, oh, so okay. So sweet melon, the, that species is also it's available? The, well, it's sweet. the same genus, but they're okay. currently classified as different species. But ooh, that's always sticky, right? We don't know. I don't think, I have not seen evolutionary studies done on bitter melon. I think it's pretty understudied. So and um, with the orcas, is there a way like they can say they can see the plants and or the tubers and say these are more acid than No, actually, and in the field, um, when Eve asks them to identify them, they taste them, and then they say, mm, "Oh." And the poshko are always pale yellow, but there are sweet ones that are also pale yellow, so and then. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the reason why they. I mean, they they simply are. Uh, treating the plants like, oh, maybe they are acid, so we will treat them all. Wait, no? Lauren, Lauren, Lauren. We plant them on completely separate fields oh, okay. and deal with them almost as two different crops. Oh. <coughs> Can I? Yeah, go, go for it. I mean, I don't know, when do I stop this? I... Yeah, this is my last. Okay. I don't know much about the origin of the octoid oka. Is there a diploid progenitor or some closely related species? Oh, uh, good. Yeah, so um, still unresolved. So this is Eve's big awesome. Um, this is hopefully what she's there to collect a lot more wild progenitors um, to see. But right now, the closest, closest related taxa are tetrapoid. Um, and they're. Okay two tetraploids that are kind of candidates for being closely related, and we're not even really sure if those two tetraploids are actually two separate species or not, um, or just had been described at the extent of a very disparate range. Um, and that's, I think, one of the questions that Eve is planning on addressing during her sampling right now. Um, but we don't know in terms of, it, it appears as though there's possibly a signal for an auto polypoidy event, but we don't know when that happened, so we think that there was some hybridization that happened. There's strong evidence for it being an allopolypoid where there's hybridization that would happen. But then we also don't know, did that hybridization happen to form the tetraploid and then there was a doubling? Or there are lots of possible ways to come up with eight. Could those factor into this reduced genome yes. sour? I think. So I think that there was probably some sort of stepwise scenario where Maybe you had the tetraploid, wild tetraploid, and it was domesticated and it was sour, and then there was another hybridization event that created the octopoid. But I'm just, that's just what I think. There's, there are a lot of possible hypotheses still. I don't remember if you said, has anyone done P, just, just pH on the wild ones? No. Mm -mm. There, so that would also be something I would like to do. Um, we tried to grow them in our study, and we tried to grow them in captivity, um, but they didn't do so great. They didn't, I didn't get data from them at all. They all died. Um, and so that would have to be something that would be done in the field, which would be pretty extensive field work. Yeah, Cooley. Uh, how widely is it grown in Texas? 
How are they what? How widely is it grown in Texas? Like, oh, it's actually not grown in Texas, but it's also grown in New Zealand. Um, so somehow Oka got introduced to New Zealand, and New Zealanders love it. Um, but it's only the sweet Oka, and they eat it kind of like a baked potato with sour cream. Oh, bless you. Um, but so the Oka that I bought in Texas was actually imported from New Zealand. I know. I know. And there was like, seriously, seriously, Christmas break. And I was like, wait, what? What is this? Uh, and is it a cap crop, uh, cash crop, big time in, in New South America? Or do you no, 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 no. It, it's pretty low market value. The, the sweet stuff will be sold at the markets, but not in like supermarkets. It's a traditional food. Um, it's really important for subsistence. Is it by any chance uh, called coming into the famine food? Every country has a list of plants. I mean, what is called famine food? And, uh, it's no, a it's just a crop. It's part of the rotation. Okay. There are several others. It's a whole little family of, of tuber crops that rotate through the potato system. Yes, big girl. I think I think we're I think we're done. All right.